Hey, if you're visiting for the first time, if you're here with your mother or if you're a mother that came here to visit with your children, my name's Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here at this church. Thanks so much for being here today. Today starts a study through the book of Ecclesiastes. For the summer months, we're going to take a verse-by-verse look through the book of Ecclesiastes. So I want to ask everybody in the room to do an experiment this week. Check this out. Watch up here for just a second. I want you to find a friend, a coworker, somebody that you know pretty well who you can ask a couple of honest questions to. And then I want you to ask them a few very simple questions. But here's the truth. The answer to the question doesn't matter. I want you to pay careful attention to how long it takes them to answer questions like this. What's your favorite color? Or what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Or what's your favorite baseball team? They better say the Atlanta Braves. (laughs) Then transition. Now pay careful attention to how this happens. But then I want you to transition the questions. And again, The the way that they answer the questions are not as important as how long it takes them to answer questions like this. Why are you here right now? What's the purpose of life? Where do you go to to find meaning in life? What do you look to for real satisfaction in life? And I guarantee you, if they have answers to those questions at all, and most of the people that you know will have no answers to those questions, if they had an answer to those questions at all, it's going to take them a long time to get to those answers. It's fascinating. You ask them about your favorite flavor of ice cream or favorite color, you'll get an answer like that. You ask them about the meaning of life, and most of them are going to stare at you with their mouth open and have no answer to those questions. The significant The most important questions, many of us have no idea how to answer because those questions are answered through a worldview. Now, the word Ecclesiastes itself, the word means preacher or teacher. Solomon, King David's son, writes this book about 3,000 years ago, and he preaches or he teaches us the Ecclesiastes. He teaches us about a worldview, and basically Solomon's challenge to all of us, what we're going to do for the next 20 weeks or so over the summer months is examine your worldview. We want to ask you to ask yourself the tough questions. We want to ask you to look at the worldview, the the view through which you see the world. If that word worldview doesn't really make sense to you, let me put it to you this way. It's like a set of sunglasses, and once you put them on, no matter where you turn your head, no matter where you look, you're seeing the world through these lenses on the sunglasses. Or better yet, worldview, it's kind of like a matrix or a grid that you assign meaning in life to. For example... Why do some people go to extraordinary lengths to try to find fame when other people could seem to care less about it? Why will some people spend millions of dollars on art or on a piece of history and other people view it as rubbish? It's because of your worldview. It's the view through which you see the world that attaches meaning to stuff. And what we're going to do over the next several months is answer questions like this. Why are you here? And where did you come from? And what is the real important, real meaning in life to begin with? Ecclesiastes is a ruthless examination of our worldviews. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to pray for us in just a second. If you've got a Bible, you can flip it open to the book of Ecclesiastes, and then we're going to do some hard work on our worldview, starting in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. Let me say a prayer for us. Father, We're here today to worship you and to take ourself out of the center of the picture and place your son Jesus at the center of the picture of our worldview. And so Jesus, for the next few moments, would you make yourself known from the book of Ecclesiastes? Holy Spirit, would you open our heart and our eyes to what this great book says and would you challenge us to look at our life and the way that we interpret life through our worldview? for the next few minutes. I pray this in King Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you've got a paper Bible, you're open in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. If you've got the Calvary Baptist Church app downloaded, you should be, uh, if you click on the Today Sermon page, you'll see the uh, scripture in front of you. Or, of course, we'll put the notes up there on the screen for you. But the first thing I want you to see is life is meaningless 
without Jesus at the center of the equation. The book Ecclesiastes has a couple of kind of unusual things about it. It's, for many Bible teachers, a challenging book to interpret. It's frustrating, and it's fascinating when you really examine it. In fact, Martin Luther, one of the great theologians and pastors of the church, the guy who helped start the Protestant Reformation, he was teaching his church through the book of Ecclesiastes. And in his personal study, he said, Solomon, the author of Ecclesiastes, this is what he wrote in his journal, Solomon the preacher, or the Ecclesiastes, is giving me a hard time. As though he begrudges anyone to lecture on him. And there's debate about this book. Debate, does it even belong in your Bible? The answer is yes. And then people ask, well, is it poetry or is it prose? And we don't know a lot about this book, but one thing's quite different about Ecclesiastes. It's one of the only books in the Old Testament that tell us immediately who wrote it. And because we know who wrote it, we can learn a lot about this book by looking at it through the eyes of the author, King Solomon. So here's what Solomon says, Ecclesiastes 1, 1 and 2. These are the words of the teacher. The word teacher, preacher, is the, synonym, is the synonym of the word Ecclesiastes. These are the words of the Ecclesiastes, the teacher, King David's son. Okay, David had lots of sons, so which son are we talking about? Oh, we know which one, the ruler of Jerusalem. That nails it down to one, Solomon. Verse 2. Check this out. Right after telling you who wrote the book, listen to this. Everything is meaningless says the teacher, completely meaningless. Okay, so I need to deal with this word meaningless for just a second. 72 times in your Old Testament. Your translation may use the word vanity. Everything is vanity. Vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Or it may use the word meaningless. 37 of those 72 times, this word shows up in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a really small book, Ecclesiastes is, in the Old Testament. And more times than the entire rest of the Old Testament put together, this book uses the word meaningless. Now, here's, here's how that word really probably should be interpreted. Worthless or empty. That's really what he's saying. Life without Jesus at the center of the equation is empty. Imagine that FedEx comes to your door tomorrow night and they ask you to sign for this package. And when you get the package inside the house and you start to rip it open, you notice that the inside of the package is empty. That's what Solomon is saying life is like without Jesus in the equation. It's empty. It's meaningless. Something's missing from it. And when he says vanity of vanities, by the way, that phrase shows up over and over again in the book of Ecclesiastes. This is the way that the Ancient Middle Eastern literature says this is the height of vanity. This is complete meaningless. You can't get any more vain or any more empty or any more meaningless than this. Life without Jesus at the center. It's meaningless. It's hopeless. What he's basically saying is what Mark Twain, the great author, once said. When you die, the world laments you for an hour, and then they forget you forever. He sang what Pastor Mark Driscoll said when he was preaching to his church about this book. He said, when you're born, you have no teeth and you're mumbling to yourself and you wear a diaper. And if you live long enough, that's the way that you end up. Life, if you pull Jesus out of the center of the equation and inevitably you start to slip into the center of the equation, life starts to look meaningless. It doesn't make sense it doesn't really take on meaning. Now, many Bible scholars are not sure when in Solomon's life he writes this passage. Some people think Solomon is trying to describe, he's trying to paint a picture for us of a worldview without Jesus in the center. I personally believe this is later in Solomon's life. I believe that women have started to distort Solomon's worldview. And Solomon is started to lose his faith along the way. And now he's noticing that as he loses his faith, everything around him starts to become meaningless. It doesn't really make sense anymore. And the truth is, believer or unbeliever, if Jesus isn't the center of your world, life starts to look meaningless. It doesn't make sense. 
so here's what I want you to see from Solomon next. Solomon next says, even your hard work doesn't make sense. It's meaningless without Jesus at the center of your life. Okay, so let me show you this picture. See if you recognize this lady. This is Mary Doyle Keith. She just passed away at 92 years old. Does anybody recognize this picture? April, April 21st, um, she passed away from Arlington, Connecticut. Mary was a teenager when a local artist in her town offered her a $10 contract to paint a picture of her. In West Arlington, Connecticut, this, this painter said, hey, I'm asking you if you'll sit down. We want you to hold a sandwich in your hand. I want, I want on your foot, underneath your foot, to be a copy of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. And in your lap, we want you to hold a riveting gun. You may not recognize this picture, but I know that you recognize the art that showed up on the cover of Saturday Evening Post, May 29th, 1943. Mary Doyle Keefe is Rosie the Riveter. And not just the country, but the world recognized this woman. What Solomon is saying is that life chews you up and it spits you out. And even your hard work chews you up and spits you out if Jesus isn't at the center of the equation. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting in verse 3. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. Is Solomon saying don't work hard? No. He's asking the question, why are you working so hard to begin with? What are you trying to amass? A bunch of wealth that doesn't stick with you after you die? And then he basically says, hey, by the way, every generation goes through the exact same thing. Listen to how he describes it in verses 4, 5, and 6. People come, they die, the earth keeps right on going. Verse 4, generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. Verse 5, the sun rises and the sun sets and it hurries around to rise again. Verse 6, the wind blows south and then it turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. And Solomon is painting this picture of even nature is like a giant machine that grounds you down. And you're like a cog in that machine. You get on the eternal treadmill and you run till exhaustion and then you die and you fall off. And another generation gets on and does the same thing. And Solomon is looking at the earth and he's looking at life through a broken worldview. Verse 7, he says, look, swim out into the middle of the Chattahoochee River and with all of your might, try to stop that river from flowing downstream. It won't make a difference. It's going to flow right into the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf of Mexico is insatiable and that water keeps right on flowing to the Atlantic Ocean. Verse 7, rivers run into the sea, but the sea's never full. And then the water returns again to the river and it flows out again into the sea. Everything is wearisome. Everything is empty. Everything is meaningless beyond description. No matter how much we see, we're never satisfied. If you're looking to yourself as the center of the picture, you will never be satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we're not content. Solomon is painting the picture of a worldview that's broken because it doesn't have Jesus at the center of the equation. Go work as hard as you can in your yard and it will look meticulous for about three days. And then it's going to look like that yard needs to be mowed all over again. Go dust your furniture and five days later, it looks like you've never dusted at all. That's just the way the machine works. And Solomon is saying, you really don't leave a lasting impact. If you're trying to change the world, it's not going to happen. But I think Solomon would say, but you can change one person's life. You're not going to change a million or a billion people's lives. Only Jesus can pull that one off. But you can change one person's life. So moms, you perhaps more than anybody else can influence somebody's worldview. A recent study just came out a couple of days ago in the UK. The UK surveyed a thousand mothers and they realized that more than Google, more than Siri on your cell phone, mothers are the most quizzed people on the planet. 
on average for a stay-at-home mom, a stay-at-home mom gets asked the question about once every two minutes and 36 seconds. So if you want me to do the math for you, that's roughly 105,120 questions a year. Hands down more questions than Google or than Siri. It's no surprise that four and five-year-olds ask the most questions and girls ask a whole lot more questions than boys do. But here's the kind of questions. And then this, this survey listed the top five questions that moms get asked. And these are questions of understanding your world. It's not how do I get to X or how much does Y cost? These are the top five questions that stay-at-home moms get asked in the UK. Why is water wet? Where does the sky end? What are shadows made out of? Why is the sky blue? Ever heard that question? Or how do fish breathe underwater? You see, children are trying to understand their world and it doesn't make sense, so they go to the authority in their lives. They go to moms and they ask moms to help them understand the stuff that doesn't make sense to them. I realize that there are some of you in this room who have been trying for years that can't have a child, and Mother's Day hurts for you. So can I challenge you to consider adoption if you're not able to conceive? And if adoption's really not God's plan for you, would you at least consider foster care? There are more than 400 kids in this city who are in need of foster care, and we have the capacity as a city to take care of about 70 of them. And that's why our church is partnering with a Christian ministry called Faith Bridge to help find foster care and help families make an investment in one life, one child in foster care and invest in one life. And you'll hear a lot more about that, us, about that from us as a church in the future. Look, even your hard work, if you're doing it for any other reason, then it is a way, as a way to bring glory to Jesus. It doesn't make sense. The last thing I want you to see, if you're following along in the worship guide, is that history itself is meaningless without Jesus. Nassim Tlaib was a university professor, and then he wrote a book that became a New York Times bestseller, and now he's basically an author, and he's on the speaking circuit. He wrote the book called Black Swan. And in the book, Black Swan, Tlaib says that history itself, it doesn't crawl along like we think about it. We're self-absorbed people, so we see history as crawling along. But in reality, it really takes leaps. And then here's what he says from the book, Black Swan. He says, we are self-absorbed people. We think that the world, that we will personally change the world, when in reality, the world just keeps right on marching along. He says, it struck me that we're just a machine for looking backwards and that humans are the great self-delusion. Here's what Tlaib is saying. It's not about you. It never was meant to be about you. You take yourself out of the center of the equation and then the world starts to make sense. You put Jesus in the center of the equation and then it becomes crystal clear. But if your worldview has got you in the center of the picture, even history itself doesn't make sense. Ecclesiastes 1, verses 9 through 11. History merely repeats itself. It's all been done before. Nothing under the sun is new. This is like the antique roadshow, right? Verse 10, sometimes people say, well, here's something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. And then he says, verse 11, we don't remember what happened in the past. In future generations, no one will remember what we're doing now. Solomon is painting a picture of a broken worldview. Here's what he says. Go to the National Mall in Washington, D.C., and go look for the National Monument to World War I, the war to end all wars. You won't find it. You'll find a monument there to the men and women from the District of Columbia that were killed in World War I, but you won't find a national monument for World War I. Because less than a generation later, right, in 1918, everybody in the world said, never again will the world fight on that scale. 
And less than a generation later, 1938, the entire world is back at it. And World War I has been eclipsed by World War II because one generation didn't learn from the mistakes of others. Basically, what Solomon is saying is that we keep making the same mistakes that our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents made. And if you want to hear something miserable, your children and grandchildren will probably make the same mistakes you did if they don't have Jesus at the center of the picture. Over and over again, Solomon is describing a broken worldview. And as a church, we want to equip you to take a ruthless examination of your worldview. So starting in about a week and a half, Pastor Alan Smith is going to teach a worldview class. If you go to our church website, you can't miss it because the big, bold banner, you like that, three Bs? The big, bold banner at the top of our website is a link to a worldview class. Over the entire summer, Alan is going to teach us a class on worldview. Here's what I'm asking. Every single person in this room, if you've never gone through a worldview study before, Will you please show up to Alan's class? And will you examine your worldview? Get in community with other people who are trying to do the same thing. And would you examine your worldview? That class starts on May 20th. That's a Wednesday night. I realize there's a few other things that are wrapping up for the next week or two after that. But it runs for the next 20 weeks or so. You can't physically be there on a Wednesday night. Okay, a second option, but it's clearly second best is to do this online. We're creating an online community. Everything that he teaches will be placed online, and you'll have the chance to interact with each other online. My goal is for everyone in this room, if you've never done it before, to go through that worldview class in person if you're able to. And if you're not able to be there in person, then at least go through it online. Because for the next 20 weeks, Solomon is going to hammer away this issue does your world have Jesus at the center? Does your worldview have Jesus at the center? And if it doesn't, I promise you, you're starting to slip into the center. And when that happens, stuff doesn't make sense. It doesn't look right. It gets out of focus. Because it was never supposed to be about you or about me in the first place. It was always supposed to be about Jesus. I want to wrap up with a challenge for us. And the challenge is maybe for somebody who's visiting or maybe you've been here for a long time. Maybe today you've realized for the first time, you know what, Jeff? I have been at the center of my worldview. I've been sitting on the throne of my heart. And Jesus isn't. And today I realize I need to, remo I need to step off of the throne of my life and I need to make the king of glory the one who sits on the throne of my heart and my life. If that's you, I'm going to challenge you in just a second to respond to what you've heard. But for all the rest of us, everybody in this room, I want to challenge you, if you've never done it before, will you get plugged in to this worldview class? I'm serious. For every single one of us, if you've never examined your worldview, you need to. So will you get plugged in to this worldview class over the summer months? Would you bow your heads? Let me say a prayer for us. And then we'll continue to worship in just a few more minutes by um, our gifts and song. But I want to challenge you right now. Father, you alone can see the worldview picture that we're looking at life through. And maybe many people in this room have made the mistake that Solomon has made of trying to look at the world through a picture that doesn't have your son at the center of the equation. We've, as believers, slipped into the unfortunate habit of placing ourself and our selfishness and our wants at the center of our worldview. God, would you forgive us? We repent. That word just simply means we're sorry. We won't do it anymore. We repent of the sin of being at the center of our worldview. And God, would you help many Christians in this room to say, I need to work on my worldview. I need to ruthlessly examine it. But maybe, Holy Spirit, for one or two people in this room, a room this size, I believe for one or two people in this room, they're examining their heart and they're realizing they've never put Jesus on the, on the throne. They've never put Jesus at the center. It's always been about them. Would you help someone in this room right now, Holy Spirit, to get serious with you? Would you help them to make a 
life, an eternal life transforming commitment to you right now by simply saying, God, I'm sorry for the sin of selfishness. And I believe that Jesus really did leave it all in heaven to come to earth. I believe that Jesus really did die on the cross, a death that I deserve. And three days later, he really did rise again so that I could have the promise of eternal life. And right here, right now where I'm sitting, this is just between me and you, God. I'm putting it all in your hands. I'm turning it all over to you. I'm trusting you for the first time as my Lord and as my Savior. And Father, if that prayer is real, if it's sincere, I know that you will radically and totally transform somebody. And their world will start to come into focus because Jesus is rightly on the throne of their heart. I pray this in your son's name and for his glory. Amen.